Uh, I think that was a pretty interesting conversation by the, uh, by the finance secretary and a good setup for the programs we're going to have uh, ongoing throughout the day. So now we're going to begin um, three panel discussions, one before lunch, which is going to talk about skills development, and then we'll have two panels after lunch as well. Uh, the first one uh, looking at uh, India's uh, concept of smart cities and how the United States can contribute to that, and then wrapping up with the final panel on Make in India. So investors looking at this Make in India campaign to see whether or not um, there really is a, a, a lot that can be accomplished through that. Um, so a variety of companies that have invested will invest, uh, and also our good friend uh, Jay Panda, member of parliament from ERISA, um, talking from his vantage point as well on what the Make in India campaign looks like from the state level. So uh, it's a little intimidating uh, to, to be up here because, of course, uh, one of my own gurus from my beginning in the 1990s in doing U.S. India, Tarun Das, um, is uh, joining me on stage. I think uh, most of you, I'm sure, uh, have run across Tarun at some point. Um, uh, Dr. Ajay Kella, uh, who is the CEO of the Wadwani Foundation, and so a very important person in my life, uh, in my role here at, uh, at CSIS. Um, and, uh, and, and a new person for me to meet as well, uh, Gwen Copsey, who's Vice President for International Strategic Partnerships at Boeing. Um, so meeting with the Boeing team and talking about the conference, and it was interesting that this was the panel that they really had an interest in because, you know, you, you think, oh, it's going to be defense sales and offsets and that kind of stuff, but, but actually it's a company that's very interested and keen on skills development, so it's really a treat, Gwen, to have you up here as well. So appreciate you coming over. Um, so let me start with, uh, with uh, Taran Das, if I might. Uh, and I think it is three great perspectives. I mean, Taran with a terrific perspective, having run CII, having taken a leadership role in Ananta Center, um, on, on you know, how we look at skills and where the gaps are and, and, and what companies, what individuals, what governments are doing to try to fill that. So, uh, so Taran, uh, let me lead off with you. I know we're very much interested in hearing okay. you know, your thoughts on this great topic. Okay, I'll just make um, five points, Rick, and thank you for having me here. One is the history of skills development in India, and just in a couple of lines. Um, it was completely government for a long, long time. There was something, there was a structure of something called industrial training institutes. We call them ITIs for short. And that is where skills training took place around the country, uh, managed by the Ministry for Labor, and private sector was not in the game. All right? If private sector was in the game, it was only doing skills training for their captive needs, for their in-company needs. All right? So that's the history. When Dr. Manmohan Singh was prime minister, actually in that government, they started worrying about this whole skills issue. And I had the privilege of chairing the first government task force on skills development. You know, nobody really looked at <laughs> skills <laughs> development as a policy, as a strategy. It was happening, and then somebody realized that, you know, maybe things were not going right for us. And we had all this demographic dividend, which could be a demographic disaster. Right? And this task force, we had private sector CEOs on it, as well as government people, came out and said, the private sector has a major role in skills development. So we need to move the ball out of the government and look at private sector's role, look at public-private partnerships, and how to take this forward in a different paradigm altogether. Right? Point two. Point three, the National Skills Development Corporation was then set up by the government as a public-private partnership corporation. 51% with the private sector. So control with the private sector, 49% funding from the government. And this corporation, the NSDC, which is headed by one of my former deputies, Dilip Chinoy, uh, who right now, I mean, he could be here today, but he's with the prime minister in Canada. He's signing MOUs with community colleges in, in Canada. Uh, for skills development programs to be launched in India. Um, this has become the central agency in the country to drive skills development. But it is working essentially with the private sector, which is new to the game. So it needs a little bit of support, infrastructure, maybe funding, and, and it is led to, in the last few years, 
several hundred private sector companies coming into skills development, actually as a business. It's not charity. Hmm. As a business. So I wanted you to name, understand this evolution. And then more recently, in this government, uh, Mr. Modi has set up a ministry for skills and entrepreneurship. So he has a cabinet minister heading that, a young cabinet minister. And what he's done is every single ministry was dealing with skills for their own areas. Okay, The health ministry, the education ministry, the civil aviation ministry, and it was chaotic. It was like anarchy. You know? Everything has been collapsed into one place. It's now coordinated and driven through the Ministry of Skills, working with the National Skills Development Corporation. That's the government structure. Now, I want to talk about the last two points, is about the US and India and skills development. And I know Ajay will talk about what they're doing, and uh, Ramesh Vadwani referred to that in his opening remarks this morning. I see skills development as a huge business opportunity for US companies. So it's one is for companies doing business there, needing the right kind of people, and training them and all of that. So that will be the Boeings and many other companies. But forget them. You have amazing firms here who do training work. Across the country, you've got an infrastructure of firms who train people. And if you just see websites and you see the internet, you see how many firms there are. What I'm saying is you have a business opportunity in India. You don't need to take on all 500 million people. <laughs> Why don't you just take on a million? You want to train a million people and make money at it? It's there. So a business opportunity in India is not only about products. It's, this is a product of a different kind. This is a human resources capacity building product which you can provide, and the market is there. It's a 500 million plus market who we are trying to skill and train. And the National Skills Development Corporation is driving this, working with private sector companies. So your private sector companies want to come in there and work. They make a beeline for the National Skills Development Corporation, connect with them, and find that there is a market and there is support. You know, there's actually financing support available to help you to get into the market of human resources capacity building. So I wanted to bring this different dimension into the conversation today. The next point is, apart from the size of the market, this is going to be a continuing market. This is a long-term market. This is not going away, you know. It's, this is not about buying uh, 30 aircraft or something. And you know, then depending on after sales service or spare parts or whatever, human beings in India have got to be trained for the next 100 years. We, we better start using you know? other than aircraft for <laughs> yeah. the panel here, so we've got an expert. So, so. Yeah. I'm looking at her, so she's going to come in. And, you know. yeah. But what I'm saying is that this is a continuing market forever. And because we have hundreds of millions of young people who need training, who need development. There it is. You know, it shows you the size of the market. I'm not sure whether in the US, skills development is seen like that, you know, as far as India is concerned. Is it seen as a market? Is it seen as a long-term market? And then, if you take what Mr. Maharishi said just now, forget the whole of India. Take one state. In one state, you have to train a million or a couple of million people. Just work with one chief minister, one state government, and focus. So one company or two companies can go in there and say, I will work with Rajasthan. They've got great labor laws. They've changed everything. They've got a great investor-friendly administration. The chief minister is very pro working with the US. I will go and work with them, and the National Skills Development Corporation will give me backup. So give you confidence, 
hand holding and get into the market and focus on one geographical area in India, not necessarily look at you know, the whole of India. I feel, and this is my last point, your smaller firms who are hesitant about India because it's tough to do business there, it's complicated. But this is green field. There are no regulations. There are no regulations. You can go and, and the cost, the low, the, the commitment of money is nothing. You, know? you don't have to build a building now until you make your millions. Uh, you don't have to invest in fixed assets. You can rent space. You can rent. So it's a low cost operation. There are margins there. And smaller firms in the US, in the services sector, who are providing training to people here, can actually look at that country, look at India as a very good market. So it's, it's a way of also getting into that market at an SME level, mm -hmm. not necessarily just the big corporations. Thank you. Good, great, thank you, Taran. Well, um, since you wrapped up mostly looking at, uh, um, at the private sector, then maybe, Gwen, I'll transition to you, since as a private sector player here and how you look at uh, the skills development uh, market in India. So if I can turn it over to you to, okay, to follow Okay, sure, up. and I'm gonna yeah. step down here and use Perfect. the podium. Yeah, great. Well, it's a good thing, because I lost my guy. Oh. I think I'm good. Can you still hear me? All right, good. Well, let's see. When we look at India, you know, India stands today as the world's largest importer of defense equipment. Indian's government, under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, and you've heard a lot about this this morning, has realized the importance of reversing this trend with initiatives such as uh, Make in India, expected to provide further support to locally manufacture uh, and assembly defense equipment. This effort is more than just an aspiration. India has both the capabilities and the government support to transform the country into a net exporter of military hardware. And as we consider India's ambitious path, we have to consider a few factors that will be important along the way. Now first, we realize that India is a late entrant to the export-led manufacturing model that has transformed economies around the world like China and other Southeast Asian countries in earlier decades. India has seemingly skipped from manufacturing as the economy transitioned from agricultural to services, but is quickly gaining capabilities and momentum in the manufacturing sector. Second, we have to take into account the consideration, the necessary conditions to grow domestic defense manufacturing, including sound infrastructure, predictable tax policies, as we talked about earlier today, uh, pragmatic labor laws, and government incentives. And above all, However, it's the availability of the skilled manpower that is the most important enabler, because without it, India cannot sustain a competitive defense industrial base. So for aerospace and defense manufacturing, the required talent pool can be broadly classified into two areas. One is the engineering and the manu manufacturing and the management pool. And the second one is the frontline factory worker. For India, the talent pool in engineering and management is currently abundant in other industrial sectors and could be applied to the aerospace domain with moderate effort. The real challenge, however, is the pool of frontline factory workers. India currently does not have a large enough workforce with such skills as precision, machining, fabrication, and assembly to meet the needs of aerospace and defense companies. This shortage of talent for skilled frontline aerospace factory workers in India creates a vicious cycle of skilled capability output mismatch. The skills are in short supply, so capabilities don't grow, and as a result, the output of the Indian aerospace manufacturing sector remains stagnant. The ripple effect then takes over. A shortage of skilled workers does not attract fresh investments, which further reduces opportunities to grow skills, and it ultimately limits the significant growth in the India's aerospace and manufacturing area and defense companies. So how do we bridge this gap between what India has and what global aerospace and defense companies need? And to answer that question, we need to take a look at the progress and limitations for Indian aerospace and defense companies. Since, opening, since the opening of India's defense sector in 2001, we are see, seeing private companies showing interest and in participating in 
aerospace manufacturing. Unfortunately, the effects of the sector being closed to foreign investment for so long still does exist. Both public and private sector manufacturers have gaps in their aerospace manufacturing skills because Indian companies simply were not exposed to the global aerospace and defense manufacturing requirements. Now, Indian companies are increasingly gathering the skills to manufacture specific work packages for major companies like Boeing and others. But those skills are specific to that project that that company is working on. That limits true skills infusion that would enable a company, an Indian company, to grow and compete for more diverse and complex work in the future. Certain Indian companies have invested in their own aerospace manufacturing sales and their skills development infrastructure in the form of labs, equipment, curriculum, and trainers. However, many of the emerging micro, small, and medium enterprise uh, companies simply cannot afford to make such investments. And further complicating matters is that there isn't a single agency in India that can authorize, at this time, an aerospace manufacturing curriculum and provide industry-recognized certifications. And while some may hope that increasing the foreign direct investment limit would encourage foreign companies to help overcome the challenge that many may not, that may not be the case. Foreign companies may be reluctant to make such investments given the reality of current skill levels and the length of time it requires to scale up. So I'm going to return to that question. How do we bridge the gap between what Indian companies have and what global aerospace and defense companies need? One suggestion is to start with the policy design to maximize the partnership between the two between the two Indian defense offset policies. Indian offset policy can be the right tool to develop aerospace, manufacturing skills, an Indian industrial base, and break the vicious cycle. The Indian defense offset policy was first published in 2005 and mandates a minimum of the foreign companies to invest 30% of the value of the products that they sell back into India. And the policy has undergone several revisions since 2005 to help further enable the development of the Indian defense industry. One of the stated objectives of the defense offset policy is to, is to foster development of internationally competitive enterprises. They want to be able to export out of India and have a robust defense market. However, the policy does not currently encourage or prioritize the imparting of skills to Indian companies. So changes to the policy that would provide foreign companies with the necessary incentives to invest in the skill development infrastructure of the country could help bridge the gap. And as the skills development infrastructure grows from both foreign company involvement and skills development and establishment of industry recognized certification, India companies of all sizes will have an opportunity to get the necessary training and certifications. As the cycle of skill capability output is broken, foreign aerospace and defense companies will have further incentives to incorporate Indian companies into their global supply chains as capabilities go up and the risk of execution go down. All in all, this would result in what we call a win-win for all stakeholders, the government of India, certainly Indian industry, and the foreign aerospace and defense companies because we're able to add significant value to our supply chain by these very capable Indian companies. So with that, that concludes my remarks. Great. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a new new angle, I think, to take a look at uh, at offsets. I, I've heard, you know, a variety of industries talk about these dollars generated through offset requirements as uh, plugging this hole and that hole, and sometimes it's a, a tenuous grasp at best uh, to what the purpose of an offset policy is. But to actually provide the education and tools for Indian uh, manufacturers to get up to speed, I think, is a, is a pretty novel uh, novel thought along those lines. Um, so we, we've taken a look at what government has done, what private sector has done. And of course, with the foundation, it starts with a number, getting so many people into jobs rather than kind of building it up from the business side. So Ajay, can you sort of walk us through you know, the foundation and how they approach this idea of getting people into jobs and the role that skills plays in doing so? OK. So I'm happy to do that. Good morning to everybody. And uh, it was at the break I was told that I need to be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ramesh had a crisis with one of his companies. Uh, he runs 23 companies, so there's always a crisis, but one of them happened to be right now. <laughs> and uh, since, uh, since, since his companies generate most of the wealth that I get to spend, I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to substitute for him. 
Um, so let me talk about the skill gap. Uh, why is skill talked about globally today? Uh, so let's start at the top, and then I'll talk about what is it that we at the foundation are, are doing, as well as what are the other organizations on the, in India that are doing on skilling. So today, the skill gap is a global phenomenon. Uh, what academia is producing and what industry wants there is a huge, huge delta. Uh, and that's reflected in what's happening. If you look at India today, even the IT industry, where the Indian, in the Indian software engineers are, are rated the highest, uh, NASCOM, which is an um, um, industry body, um, they did a recent study on the graduates that are coming out of Indian en engineering organization, and 80% of them are unemployable. So you don't have the talent that there is. So if you look at uh, Infosys, which is one of the largest uh, Indian IT companies, they've set up a large campus in Mysore, uh, where they pre-hire students, uh, 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 they hire students on graduation, they put them in a one-year training program before they uh, engage them in, uh, in jobs. Uh, also on the US side, even developed econo economies have a problem with uh, the skill gap today. Uh, about three years ago when we were looking at data, and, and the reflection of a skill gap is really, uh, it shows up in youth unemployment, because these are students that are graduating and they are not employable. Uh, three years ago when we looked at the US data, there are, there were about eight, overall unemployment was somewhere around 8%. Youth unemployment was 16%. And youth between 16 and 19 was close to 24%. At that time, about 4 million jobs were open in the US. And 60% of the employers were complaining that they can't find the talent to fill the jobs. So I think you have talked about that as well. Uh, uh, so that, that phenomena exists today. In fact, now, if you look at the data today, the unemployment rate in US has gone down to 5%, but still uh, the youth unemployment is 3x, and the open jobs have gone up from 4 million to close to 6 million. So another reflection that it's the skill gap that is causing the issue. Um, so about three years ago, we as a foundation said, what can we do in this area? Uh, and since we were focused in India, we started in India uh, with the skill. Uh, it's a massive problem. India is adding about a million people a month to the workforce. So every, essentially every month, about a million youth are turning 18 and are entering the workforce, or, or they are going to colleges. So there's, there is a massive demand. Um, when we looked at the entire skill pyramid, we found that uh, if you looked at an 18-year-old that's graduating 12th grade, about 9 million students graduate 12th grade uh, in India. About 4 million go to these three-year, four-year colleges that are existing. Four and a half million students are left behind. Uh, and in this day and age, uh, 12th grade education with a knowledge economy taking shape, a 12th grade education is not enough. The new K-12 is really the new K-14. I think President Obama also recently talked about uh, making community colleges uh, free in the, uh, in, in the US. Uh, and India has nothing, really. Uh, so there is a 12th grade, and then there is uh, college education. So in between, there is a huge gap, and this is what I think Tarun and uh, others had looked at the problem and set up the National Skill Development Corporation. Um, we as a foundation as a, are an operating foundation. Most of us have spent time in the valley, so we, we wanted to bring in technology innovation to scale to address this problem. Uh, so what we are doing is, uh, so we targeted 12th graders that are not going to college. Uh, and for them, in, in US, uh, if you look at the similar data, 25% of US graduates go to 
four-year colleges. I think some of you will be shocked by that number, but the number really is only 25% of US graduates go to four-year colleges. About 46% go to community colleges, which are the two-year program. So the community college model in the US was a very good model. Uh, just like Tarun talked about, US training industry can have an opportunity to go to India and train the 500 million youth that we are talking about. US community colleges have an opportunity to set up community colleges in the US because there is a huge gap. Uh, so we pushed that idea uh, with the government of India. At that time, it was Manmohan Singh's government. And we got good traction even there. Uh, and what has resulted in there is the, they have put in a legislation now where, uh, where there will be uh, uh, recognition of skills and training. Uh, set, they are setting up equivalent of community colleges, which will have upward mobility into the four-year college, so it's not a dead-end stream. Uh, the Indian government has now funded about 400 community colleges as a pilot uh, and are collaborating with foreign governments. Tarun talked about uh, Prime Minister Modi is in Canada now signing up uh, agreement with the, with the Canadian community colleges. So, so, you know, we had originated and started this with U.S. Uh, and we are finding U.S. community colleges not as aggressively pushing. In fact, Canada and Germany and Australia have jumped onto this bandwagon. U.S. has not. Uh, so it's an opportunity in the U.S. to jump onto this. Coming back to the foundation, while these colleges are getting set up, uh, I, I think we cannot wait for these infrastructure to come in place. You know, if we go back to the brick and mortar model of educating that large population, uh, it will take decades, if not half a century. So we, as a foundation, said, why don't we leverage technology to impart this? So the foundation focus has now shifted from sort of setting this mechanism in place to investing in what we call the soft infrastructure. The soft infrastructure essentially is creating uh, pedagogy, creating uh, learning modules. Today, how many of you, when you're stuck trying to learn something, go to YouTube and watch videos? Show of hands. Uh, Not bad. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we are trying to do, essentially, is to transform. So uh, the way we started this as a pilot, actually, we are doing this both in the US as well as in India. Let me talk about India. Uh, India has about 1.2 billion people, as you know. Uh, healthcare is a major issue. Uh, um, nurses and nursing assistant, there is a demand for somewhere around a million nursing assistant in the next five years. Uh, you don't need a college degree for that. You can take a 12th grader, put them through a one year or an 18 month program and they can become nursing assistants, earning family supporting wages. Uh, in the absence of community colleges in the industry was doing that job. So we went to the industry and said, give us the content that you have. Uh, this is really not your job of training. Your job is to take care of the patients. We will work with us, we will transform your content, which is very teacher-centric and non-scalable, and transform it into videos, animation, and gaming, and offer it through the cloud to everybody in the industry. Uh, so about 18 months ago, we worked with one of the hospital chains. Today, we are working across five big hospital chains, about hundreds of hospitals that have adopted this program. Similarly, on hospitality, we are doing the same thing. Uh, and we have now entered into an agreement with the defense industry. Uh, defense industry needs a lot of you know, support. All the equipment that you are importing from defense need to be maintained and managed. So we are building up those, uh, those uh, uh, platforms. So essentially, long story short, the investment uh, in skilling can sort of only happen through leveraging modern technology 
to address the problem at scale. Uh, and that's what we are trying to achieve. Oh, terrific, Ajay. Thank you. Great. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions, and I, I want to start off, you know, one thing that I've learned, I think most of all, by getting to uh, uh, shadow uh, Tarun over the years is uh, cutting to the chase and knowing what is the flash and what is the substance. So one issue on education that I think captures a lot of attention here, which we didn't talk as much about, is American four-year universities. And is there a role they can play in contributing to skills and education in India? And this bill comes through, and it hasn't passed yet, about allowing foreign investment in universities. Is that a game changer? Is it not? Some schools don't like campuses overseas. You know, what's been your experience? Do, do you think that there's that much of a role uh, for American for universities to go there, set up, do things? Or is it going to be, you know, other models, the private sector model, community colleges? Do you have a sense on that? Uh, Rick, I think we are sending about 100,000 students to American universities each year. Okay? Uh, that will only grow because the kids want to come to America to study. All right. It's not just studying in an American university in India, if there was a campus there. It is the whole experience of being here, being on campus, you know, all of that, international students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's one point. I think they, the drive, that, he, that, that hunger to come here to study is not going to come down. It's going to just grow, grow and grow and grow. It will, we'll have to see your university's capacity to take uh, more and more kids coming, mm -hmm. you know, depending on size of classes and all of that. Second, what I have seen in my conversations with uh, American universities is that they are able to set up a small center in India, but they don't have resources to go big time into setting up in India, you know. So they need then an Indian partner or, or, a, or a partner who will provide funds for, for doing that. You know, so private universities are happening in India now. Uh, there's one great example of the Ashoka University uh, near Delhi, which is uh, funded by private sector uh, entrepreneurs. They have collaborations with individual universities for different disciplines. So in a way, you're transferring the teaching and the know-how, mm -hmm. but you, and you're getting paid for it. Again, it's like a business opportunity, which is great for the university, but it is not an investment by the university okay. in terms of money going out, because you need the money here. And I think after the financial crash, in 2008, I think a lot of universities' endowments you know, were impacted big time. So my sense is um, there'll be different ways that universities will get involved there. A lot of it is to recruit students to come here, <laughs> actually. It's a marketing office. Mm -hmm. you know? It's a liaison come marketing office. But as Ajay mentioned, community colleges are still not seeing the business opportunity in India. Yet. Today, the Prime Minister's team will sign up with 16 Canadian community colleges, 16 today, in Ottawa. All right. The National Skill Development Corporation CEO is coming here tomorrow for other meetings, and he was telling me that he will sign two agreements with two community colleges, one in Austin, Texas, and one somewhere else. But it's like, you know, more the exception than the rule. So I think we have some work to do here in opening the business opportunity to community colleges. It is a business opportunity, as I said. It's not charity and all that. And people like Ajay and all who are here and the Badwani Foundation can actually be very helpful in this process. Um, you know, Gwen, India is not the first country on Earth to take a look at aerospace and think, I'm going to be the next big aerospace player. Um, you know, talking about trying to help workers get the skills to be able to, to, to do that, ha have you seen a country that has committed itself to, you know, really kind of imparting the sort of education 
in a relatively short period of time to become competitive? Or is India perhaps trotting a bit of new ground if they're successful in doing this? Well, I mean, I think I'll just kind of focus on India with the answer to your question. So, um, I mean, our experience in India with, with working with the industry there, and we do have quite a few industry partners that we work with, um, is that they do have that requirement for employees to have certain skills. Mm -hmm. And so what we've found, and we've invested millions of dollars in India with uh, people that are helped to develop supply chains, help provide skills on program management, uh, help provide some of the technical skills on the trades, et cetera. Um, and, but we've typically done it based on where we're sourcing the work. So we do it on a company by company basis, depend upon their needs. And that certainly is one way to get there but it's not the way to get there probably the fastest mm -hmm. that you would want to get. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I absolutely agree with a lot of what you two gentlemen are saying here about how you need this more broader focus. Uh, and I'm, and I'm going to speak specifically for aerospace and defense mm -hmm. because you know, I'm part of the Boeing company and that's what we're interested in. And I think it's, 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 it's encouraging having a, a model that encourages companies that are in India for the long term, which the Boeing company certainly is, We've been involved in India for a long term, certainly on the commercial side, more recently on the defense side. But there has to be uh, an encouragement and an incentive for us to, to do uh, more broad training and development and certifications for the kind of skills that are necessary um, for uh, like a, whether it's a sheet metal worker, an assembly, a person that does assembly, uh, quality, you know, quality management, all those kinds of things that are inherent in the certifications that you need to get for aerospace. And I would say the companies that, or the countries that have done it well, is a lot of what they do is they do encourage it through their policy and through some other offset policies as well. It encourages uh, and recognizes the importance of skills development as they look at uh, projects that would be acceptable uh, for, um, for defense offset. And that's something that I believe you know, and I'm touched on a little bit, is that's one of the policy changes I think that we need to look at in the future. And, and India has done a tremendous job at continuing to enhance their policy on defense so that it really benefits and achieves the objectives and the vision for more make in India and growing that defense industry. But I don't think right now it, it really incentivizes companies to do a more broad reach across multiple companies who they maybe aren't even going to be working with directly but maybe their supply chain could or other competitors, it doesn't currently recognize that in a way that encourages people to do it for the broader base. We'll do it for the companies we're working with and we're doing that, right. but that's gonna be a step-by-step -step approach yep. and that won't get it, you won't get it done as quickly as you would like in terms of you know, the vision that you'd have for the country to really grow their defense industry. Mm. Uh, well, one more question from my side and then I'll open it up uh, and for, for Ajay. So, um, I've, I've seen it a number of times over the years. Uh, an American organization, whether it's a company or a foundation, uh, comes to India and says, I'm here to help. And even though it has strong India roots already, uh, what's the receptivity been? I mean, obviously, you're coming only to help. Um, and, and what's the receptivity been at the center and state level when you say that you want to do this? Are they willing to open up and partner with you? Did it take a while? Because like, that's one thing that turns again, whether it's companies or foundations, turns people off with India sometimes is they don't see that responsiveness. So what's been your engagement with government? How's that impacted things? Um, surprisingly, quite well. Uh, I think, uh, but it's not Silicon Valley standards either. <laughs> <laughs> or it's not even business standards. It takes a while. Uh, the, mission, the mission of the bureaucrats and ministers is, is Yes, it is to do good, but at the end of the day also, it's the vote banks and chasing that. So there is, sometimes there is conflict. But just to give you an example, right, we, we started working with the Indian government only three years ago uh, on the skill development side. And one of the other initiatives we have is on entrepreneurship. Uh, to give you a flavor on skills development, A, we were able to put in this policy uh, working. There was something in the pipeline anyway but it helped put in place uh, the vocational education skill development as recognized in upward mobility. They have funded 400 colleges. Today, we have taken our online skilling into 
1,000 schools uh, around four states in India. Um, just last month, we signed an MOU. So now, now we are at a stage where we have done 1,000 schools, uh, 1,000 high schools, and 400 community colleges at the, at the various state level. Uh, and our, one of our other initiatives is entrepreneurship. We've been doing that for 10 years. The idea there is to take a college student and inspire and educate them to become entrepreneurs because we can't rely on the Tatas and Birlas to create companies. We want our students to start creating companies. Um, uh, and that, that is happening. Uh, so today, the foundation is doing somewhere around uh, uh, working through 500 institutes in India and they are, uh, our students are creating 1,000 companies on graduation every year. Uh, each of them, them create about uh, 10 jobs. So it's about 1,000 companies creating 10 jobs is 10,000 jobs. It doesn't have an impact on a million jobs a month. So we were looking at taking what we had built over 10 years on entrepreneurship, over three years on vocational education, and scale it 10x and 100x. Uh, so the Ministry of Skills and Entrepreneurship, as an example, signed an MOU with us to take what we have developed and scale it from the 1,000 colleges that exist to 50,000 colleges. All they need to do is sort of come in and say, OK, vocational education is a requirement in every school. We have the soft infrastructure in place to deliver the content. Uh, so that's an example. Similarly, on entrepreneurship, we, are, we had signed an agreement to take uh, from, from our 500 colleges to 5,000 colleges. So we can uh, increase the order of magnitude of entrepreneurs that are created. All of this has happened over three years. All of this has happened in two years of Modi's uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's government and one year of Modi, Modi government. With the Modi government, what we are getting energized and excited about is we are talking about taking from numbers from thousands to millions. And the problem in India is in the millions. It's not in the thousands. If you can do thousands and you're only impacting a very small segment, you're not solving the problem. Uh, so our vision has always been addressing the problem at scale through technology. And we are very hopeful we'll be able to do this. Romesh earlier talked about when he visited, he met uh, the prime minister in September visited uh, uh, in February, and we met with four ministers, and with all those four ministers, we're now signing MOUs. So things, things are moving a lot more rapidly than, than we would have expected government of India to move. I think also, I would also encourage uh, working with the states, uh, because most of this implementation happens in the states. Uh, so the states are far more receptive and far more eager as well. While the center sets the policies and can dole out a lot of cash, the implementation happens at the state level. And so you eventually have to work with the states. Great, great. Well, we've got a couple of minutes before lunch, um, and so I'll open it up to the floor to see if uh, anybody else has questions. Uh, quite a few. Great, great. Well, we've got a couple of microphones coming around, so let's start on the side over here. And if you could state uh, your name and, uh, and who you represent, and then try to keep it relatively brief, please. Uh, my name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of a, a profit company called Seguero's International Group and a nonprofit called Hope for Tomorrow, all doing the same thing. Uh, I'm a USA company based here, and I come from Africa. I think we have more Indians in Africa, and even my grandson is in India, uh, taking law in India. Looking at what you have explained, I think uh, vocational training is very, very important, and that's what we are trying to do with my Kanban in the rural areas of Africa and my organization focusing on skills training and uh, training. So ha looking at using agriculture products eh, to export to the US and other countries around the world. So what you say it is very important. So how do we make this technology or collaboration, working with countries, other countries like what you are doing, exporting to the US, exporting to India and other countries. I think technical institutions, uh, vocation is very, very important. So how can we collaborate and work together to make uh, this happen? Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, I'll just say real briefly, I mean, we don't have a trilateral dialogue that I think is quite so substantive yet on U.S., India, Africa, but it's talked about. And Africa clearly is one of the places that I think American companies, Indian companies and institutions have shared strengths and shared engagement. So I think it is quite open right now and, and something that I think uh, you know, is, is ripe for discussion, but uh, really underutilized at this point. So it's a, it's a terrific message. I don't know if anybody has anything else to share on that. Obviously, the foundation's moving into Africa pretty soon, uh, more on the entrepreneurship side than the skill side at first. Actually, but, both. Uh, is it both? Okay. Yeah. And so he's going to be living this. So there you go. Yeah. You know who you're going to catch up with at lunch. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are Indian companies uh, who are setting up skill centers in Africa, people who are uh, engaged with African business in a big way. And uh, we can maybe connect you to some of them. Too. Great. Um, yeah, up here at the front. Yeah. Uh, Dave Ramaswamy, I'm a consultant and journalist in agribusiness. Agri uh, my question is, you know, India, with one third of America's land area, has the same, has more arable land, and yet the Indian agriculture sector employs 65 percent of the population, with only 13 percent contribution to GDP. And as a result, similar to the job growth rates in the last 10 years, the agriculture sector has grown at only 2 percent per year. So my question is, given the productivity gap and consequently the nutritional gaps that exist in agriculture, how do you see skill development and entrepreneurship to increase uh, the nutritional content in India as well as create a whole bunch of new food entrepreneurs? Thank you. Food entrepreneurship, interesting. I don't know. Tom, Me too. Roger. I'll have a crack at it. Um, I think we are going through a whole process of changing Indian agriculture. You know, small holdings, small family situations, uneconomic, low productivity, and all of that, uh, to bringing in more technology. And because the next generation do not want to work on the farms. They want to move to urban locations. They want to get into IT or financial services or whatever, you know, manufacturing maybe. So um, I think you will see a transformation in agriculture happening. It's a slow process because they're in the rural areas. But if you go into, say you go to a town like Gurgaon, which is just outside Delhi, it's a new, new town, township. And you go into all the malls, there are lots of malls there. The, the shop assistant is a rural kid. He has, he or she has got some elementary English knowledge, can operate the equipment there in terms of, you know, invoicing, receipts, and all of that, and is able to deal with the customer. So they're all being absorbed, say, into the retail sector. If you go into private hospitals, in the, again, in the same township, You'll find people have come, young people have moved out from the rural sector into jobs as you know, hospital assistants, doing administrative work, or whatever. So there's a migration taking place. And that migration is happening with training to equip them for their new jobs. It's happening right across the country. I'm only talking about Gurgaon because I live there outside Delhi, and I'm, I'm familiar with it, and I see it all the time. Uh, we have to raise agriculture uh, productivity, but that's a different subject. I, th I think the, the real issue is what are happening, what's happening to the people there. I think the people, the young people want to move out. So there'll be many less people dependent on agriculture as we go forward, which has happened the world over. So it, it's nothing, it just happens with technology and urbanization and all of that. What is all the smart cities all about? It, it's basically a hundred new townships in India where your catchment area, the pe boys and girls from the rural areas are going to come there. So we are going through a kind of a silent revolution in India, uh, a people migration revolution, a skills revolution, a technology revolution because you can't deal with all the problems unless you use technology. So all of that, but 
I think we are, we are heading in the right direction and there's new energy right now in India, which, which hasn't been there for many years. I think, yeah, just to add to that, uh, um, I think there are a lot of questions, so maybe I'll hold on. <laughs> we can talk offline. Sure. Well, it's just about uh, lunchtime, so we'll take, uh, we'll take one or two more depending on how long. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's start up at the, uh, the front here, the third row back, uh, coming up on the other side. Yeah, terrific. Uh, my name is Ramesh Kapoor. I am uh, uh, a president of U.S. India Security Council at the present time. My question is, uh, 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 what is your relationship uh, with, with other Indian organizations that are doing the same work? One is specific is American India Foundation. Uh, how are you partnering with them and how are you scaling with them? Because uh, that organization is for over 10 years or 12 years now in, uh, in, in uh, uh, doing charities in India. Right. Um, so we, we are an operating foundation. We are trying to really leverage technology to scale. But simultaneously, we don't do all the work ourselves. And you talked about the America India Foundation. We have been partnering with the America India Foundation for the last three years now. One of our initiatives is uh, is driving mainstreaming the educated disabled uh, into corporate jobs in India. And that's where we have used America India Foundation uh, and several other NGOs that are doing skilling at a lot. A lot of these organizations were skilling, but they weren't uh, integrating the disabled into the skilling process. So we have worked with them to integrate the disabled and are working with them. Uh, we can do this alone. So I think the key partners that we envision uh, to scale to the numbers that we are looking at uh, are the three beneficiaries, really. One is the, the primary beneficiary on job creation, skill development, is the government. So government partnership is key. The uh, second beneficiary is the corporates themselves, the industry. At the end of the day, if, if the industry is getting well-trained people that they can employ from day one, uh, they are saving on their training costs. So they are actively engaged with us now, uh, sitting on the table, helping define the content, helping roll out the content. And the third beneficiary are the students themselves. Uh, and to reach them, we, will, we are using a variety of partners like the America India Foundation. Okay, we'll take one more. I see a hand, uh, Marshall, back there in the, uh, in the back. Marshall Bhutan, I just wanted to follow up on Dave Ramosamy's question to Tarun about agriculture. Um, and I agree entirely with the depiction that Tarun has given of what's happening. In fact, you know, the, the rural labor force is declining. Labor, wa labor wages in the rural sector are going up. It's becoming, it's one of the, the drivers of change in Indian agriculture. But I wanted to, I think something was lost because I think David was pointing to uh, entrepreneurial opportunities on both, end of that, both ends of that supply chain. Uh, on the agricultural side, this is going to inevitably produce consolidation, new forms of cultivation, not, not aimed at sustainability, but at supplying food to the cities. And then along the chain, transport and logistics, um, to supply food to these increasingly mega cities. And finally, uh, food production itself, food processing, food retailing, are also awaiting uh, a real revolution in Indian industry. Um, the double walla is going eventually to be a thing of the past. Uh, and Indians are already gravitating uh, to chains, mostly of Western origin, but increasingly of Indian origin. So I think the food, the whole ag to food supply chain has a tremendous opportunity and very little uh, skill development for that purpose, I think. Yeah. I think it's a point. I don't know if it needs a yeah, yeah. Nice. broad agreement, I think, from everybody up on stage here, Marshall. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Well, I hope you uh, join me in welcoming and thanking the panel for this, uh, for this start of the discussion here on skills. Um, now, clearly, there's got to be a business model for this. There is already. Companies have to look to take advantage. You know, as Gwen mentioned, you know, countries have to look at all the resources they have at their disposal, such as offset policy and things, to try to foment that. 
and the great work, and especially that the Indian government, I think, state, center and state level, has actually been welcoming for this, which you don't always hear when we talk about India. So that's, I think, should, uh, should, should warm our hearts a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, on that discussion, a lot's happening up in Canada today. So those 16 community colleges, it? Gonna be a lot more ice hockey in India, I think, uh, in, the, in the years looking ahead. Um, so uh, right now we're gonna break for lunch. Uh, we've got sandwiches in the back. And so uh, to that end, let me also recognize once again uh, the, the, uh, the sponsors that help make today's program uh, possible. So Corning, uh, Prudential, our good friends at uh, Taj Hotels and Tata, uh, Oracle Corporation, so thanks to them. The sandwiches are on them as well as the, uh, the drinks after it all wraps up. Uh, and then for those uh, speakers as well, um, we've got a, a lunch on the ninth floor. So uh, if you were indicated before about joining that lunch, then uh, please see our team over at the elevators. Uh, we'll reconvene at uh, 1.15. Thank you. <laughs>